If you have your Bibles this morning, let's turn to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 7. 1 Kings chapter 7. And we're going to read verse 48 through 50a, the first part of verse 50, 50a. 1 Kings chapter 7 and verse 48 and following. If you would please stand for the reading of God's word as we look at this brief passage of scripture. It says, Solomon made all the furniture which was in the house of the Lord, the golden altar and the golden table on which the bread of the presence was laid, and the lampstands, five on the right and five on the left, in front of the inner sanctuary of pure gold, and the flowers and the lamps and the tongs of gold, and the cups and the snuffers and the bowls and the spoons and the fire pans of pure gold. Of pure Gold, and it continues there, but I'll stop right there. This is talking about preparations for the building of Solomon's temple. We talked about this just a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the temple filling with smoke. And we talked about how that actually happened in the Old Testament times after Solomon prayed a prayer of dedication and God's glory filled the temple with smoke. Here we're talking about the items or the uh, furniture of the temple being prepared prior to the temple actually being completed. And we see several items all made of gold, but the one that I will point out to you specifically this morning in the first part of verse 50 is the bowls. The golden bowls. I don't know about your house, but at my house we use bowls more than we use plates. I can never find a clean bowl because we've always used up all the bowls in the house. My kids like bowls. Bowls are really handy for all sorts of reasons. And in the temple days, they used them for a multitude of purposes, but primarily they were used to pour out grain offerings or drink offerings upon the altar. But as we talk about golden bowls this morning that we will find in the book of Revelation, they're not going to be pouring out offerings. They're going to be pouring out something else. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today, and I pray that as we open your word this morning and we begin to study, God, that you would speak to us all through the power of your living word, for it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And God, I just pray, God, that you would use your word today to penetrate our hearts and to help cut off any dross or any spiritual fat that we might have on us, God, and that you would shape us and mold us and mature us and grow us through the power of your word, into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. For we pray in his name. Amen. As you're being seated, you can turn back to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, where we will continue this morning in our study through Revelation. What a journey it has been so far. we still got a little ways to go just yet. This morning, as we begin exploring Revelation chapter 16, we are going to see a record of the seven bowl judgments. These are oftentimes synonymously called the seven plagues. And so there on your bulletin, you may have noticed I titled the sermon the seven bowls, but in parentheses I put plagues. Because the seven bowls and the seven plagues refer to the same thing. And the Bible sometimes times uses the word plagues rather than bowls. And so let's not let this be a point of confusion. The bowls and the plagues are the same series of judgments. This is God's final series of judgments upon the earth. This is the last set. Following these judgments, the great tribulation will come to an end. And Jesus will return to the earth to set up his kingdom as we will see in the final chapters of Revelation. We are nearing the end of the tribulation portion of the book of Revelation. This morning we will consider the first five bold judgments, which are vividly depicted in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 16. Next week, having been revived from our revival this week, we 
we're going to come and finish chapter 16 next Sunday morning uh, as we complete the bowl judgments next week. But today, we're going to look at the first five. Now, before we begin this morning, I would pause just for a moment for us to remember the scene that we described in the previous chapter. Because as you may recall, chapter 15, I told you, is an introduction to, it is a prelude to, chapter 16. And so, in order for us to fully appreciate and understand what's happening in chapter 16, we need to remember and be reminded just briefly of what John described in chapter 15. So, just a quick memory jog here. John described in chapter 15 seeing seven angels coming out of the heavenly temple. And remember that one of the four living creatures who surrounds God, God's throne, one of them gave each of these angels a golden bowl. A golden bowl. And do you remember what was in the golden bowl? The wrath of God. Each bowl was full of the wrath of God. Now obviously this is, this is symbolic, this is metaphoric type language. But we imagine in our mind we depict bowls that are full of God's wrath. And these angels were preparing in chapter 17, or chapter 15, they were being prepared to pour out these bowls of God's wrath, these judgments, on the earth when we get to chapter 16. Also, you may recall in chapter 15 that the heavenly temple was filled with smoke so that no one could enter during the entire time that the bowls were being poured out. So as we are discussing the events in chapter 16, remember that the temple in heaven would be simultaneously filled with the smoke of God's glory so that none could enter it. So that is happening in heaven as we are discussing the bowls judgments being poured out on the earth. Now I have, you, don't, don't, don't freak out here this morning, I have five points this morning instead of three. But my five points are all relatively brief. And I thought to myself, since this is so obvious what the five points are, I won't put blanks on your outline today. So all you have to do is just follow along with me. The first point is the first bowl. The second point is the second bowl. And so forth, all the way down the road until we get to number five. So it should be pretty easy to follow me this morning. So with that, we'll go ahead and start with number one. The first bowl. The angels are standing there. They're ready to go. They're ready to pour out the bowls. And so let's start in chapter 16, verse 1. Then I, that's John, heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. And it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Remember, the temple is full of smoke. The heavenly temple is full of the manifest glory of God. And so where does the voice that he hears come from? The temple. So we can deduce from that, God is speaking from the temple, where his manifest glory has filled the temple with this smoke. And he basically is sounding the starting gun for these angels to begin pouring out the final set of judgment upon the earth. And he tells the first angel to go and to pour out his bowl on the earth and obediently the first angel does as he is directed. And scripture tells us that when the first bowl was poured out, 
a painful and harmful sore, a loathsome and malignant sore, afflicted those who had the mark of the beast or who had worshipped his image. Remember a few chapters ago we talked about the mark of the beast and the number 666, the mark of his name. We also talked about the fact that the false prophet led the people to erect a, a image of the beast that moved and had power that was placed in the temple and desecrated the temple. But all worship to God was ceased and those who came worshipped the image of the beast, the Antichrist. And many submitted to him. The majority, of the overwhelming majority submitted to the beast and were enamored by the beast and had awe of the beast and they took his mark either upon their forehead or their right hand. Right hand, there you go. Now the Bible doesn't tell us much about these sores. It doesn't give us much detail other than they were obviously very agonizing and painful. My, my, my version, the uh, New American Standard that I preach out of says they were loathsome and malignant. And, and I'm not a doctor, but I know that malignant is bad. I mean, benign is not great, but, but it's a lot better than malignant. These are horrible sores. We don't have a lot of detail about them. We don't know exactly where on the body they, they appeared. We don't know if it was just one sore or if it was multiple sores. We don't know how long they lingered or how long they remained or how deep down into the body that they uh, infected. But we can imagine they are horribly painful sores. But what was more important is not the details of the sore specifically, the important detail is upon whom were they directed. It says these sores were directed specifically toward those who worshipped and or followed the Antichrist. Those who had taken the mark those who had worshipped the image of the beast. Now, listen to me for just a minute. Up until this point, throughout all of the revelation that we have studied so far and all of the judgments that we have seen, up to this point, the devastation of the tribulation has generally affected the entire earth and all of its inhabitants and or the persecutions orchestrated by the tyrannical Antichrist have been narrowly targeted towards Israel and the tribulation saints. When we talk about worldwide violence, that affects everybody. When we talk about worldwide famine, that affects everybody. When we talk about worldwide uh, pestilence, that affects everybody. When we talk about uh, some of the judgments that have already up to this point falling on the earth, surely they would impact everybody. They are, they are kind of more general in nature. Yeah. And the Antichrist who has come to power is, is specifically tormenting God's children and Israel for the very first time in the book of Revelation, we see God's judgment pointed specifically at the Antichrist's followers. For the first time, God's anger and His ire is aimed at His enemies. And this marks a major turning point. Because what we see with the beginning of the bold judgments is the beginning of the end <laughs> for Satan the dragon, the Antichrist, the beast from the sea, and the false prophet, the beast from the earth, and all of their followers. This is the beginning of the end. 
the first bowl. Well, let's move on to the second bowl. Chapter 16, verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl unto the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. Every living thing in the sea died. John describes seeing the second angel pour his bowl into the sea. And as I said right there, it turned to blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. That would be plants and animals. Every living thing. Now, what we're going to discover as we read through the bowl judgments is that many of them are comparable to the trumpet judgments which we saw earlier in this series. They took place earlier during the first and middle part of the Great Tribulation. From my, from my standpoint, that's when they took place. While, they, while the Antichrist was uh, reigning and at the height of his power. And we see some, some parallels between these judgments. And so, let's just take a look. If you, if you mark the place there in Revelation 16 and, and flip back to Revelation chapter 8 where we were a couple of months ago in this series, I will point, point out to you the second trumpet in verses 8 and 9 of Revelation 8. It said, The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a great mountain with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures who were in the sea that had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. You remember we called these first four trumpets the one-third judgments because they were um, limited to a fractional degree. Now, one-third is still a lot. One-third of the sea was turned to blood and persisted that way throughout the tribulation up until the point that we come to the bowls, which are now in the final months of the tribulation. And what we see here now is that the bowls complete what the trumpets started. The trumpet, the second trumpet, is correlated with the second bowl. One third of the sea had been turned to blood. One third of the sea creatures had died. And now, as a result of the second bowl, the destruction is fully complete. 100% of the seas, the oceans, the salt water in the earth, the bodies of salt water are turned to blood. All of it. And 100% of all of the living things in the sea, both the plants and the plankton and the algae and the sea creatures, the fish and the, the mammals that are in the sea, like the dolphins and the whales and so forth, all of the sea life was killed. All of it. Now it's hard for me to imagine the many effects that this would have. In an instant, there would be no more marine life. There would be no more ocean creatures to eat. Now I don't know about you, but one of my favorite places to go is Red Lobster. And I'm not trying to make a pun with the word red here. But it's going to be red at that point. But Red Lobster is a, is a place that I love to go eat. But hey, no more shrimp. No more lobster. No more sea creatures of any kind. Listen, if you like seafood, you're out of luck. Of course, at this point, I think you'd have other things on your mind. But not only seafood... Think of all of the other products that are made from sea creatures. I mean, we get medicines from sea creatures and sea plants. We get certain types of one of my son's favorite things to eat as a snack is seaweed. He got that from Paul, by the way, when Paul was here. They ate a lot of seaweed in, in uh, Korea and Japan and those places. It's pretty good, actually. But the, the fat 
off of wells is used for oils and all sorts of things. The skin of many of these marine creatures is used in some places for clothing and for other type of textiles. As it's waterproof and it makes great uh, waterproof type garments and those types of things. All of it gone in an instant. Shipping and marine trade would come to a complete and abrupt end, I would think. I mean, I'm not getting on a, a, a barge and selling across an ocean of blood. It would disrupt the world's economy, which was already floundering because a third of the water was already blood and hadn't been for a while. Travel would be greatly altered. International travel would be extremely affected and restricted. I think I'd be real hesitant to get on a plane and fly a 12-hour flight across an ocean of blood. And those are just the more nominal things. Let's talk about the contamination and the pollution and the putrefication, that's a fun word to say, from oceans that are blood Think about all of the ripple effects and the sickness and the various problems that it would cause. It's, it's hard to imagine the scope of the damage that this would cause. But that's just the second ball. We're just getting warmed up. Let's move to the third ball. Revelation Chapter 16. We are now in verse 8 and 9. Let me get back there. I've moved over to 8, chapter 8. The third bowl. I'm sorry, we are in chapter, uh, verses 4 through 7. My apologies, I jumped ahead. The third bowl, starting in verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl onto the rivers and the springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard an angel, the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you. Who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judged these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, and they deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So next John describes the third angel pouring out his bowl on the earth, and all of the freshwater rivers and springs and by the way, let's just follow that there. Lakes are made from rivers. Ponds are made from rivers. So basically what he's saying is all of the surface water and the springs are under. So your springs, your reservoirs, your wells, all of the underwater fresh water, all of it is also turned to blood. And John heard... That's an interesting title, the angel of the waters, the angel who would impact the waters. Praising God. And what was he praising God for? For avenging the blood of the saints and the prophets who had been slain. And how did he do so? By giving those who martyred them blood to drink. And the altar echoed the same praise. Listen to these words. They deserve it. Wow. Can't say it much more plainly than that, can you? They deserve it. Now I have read that it is not toxic to the human body to drink blood. Obviously, blood does not have the same benefits that water provides to the body. Blood, obviously, is necessary for life, but blood is not really a great replacement for water. But it won't kill you, at least not immediately. It's probably going to make you sick, and it's probably going to make you weak, but if it's all you got, you can drink it. I can't imagine the ugh, 
that you would have to have to drink blood, but if it's all you got, <laughs> all the water is turned to blood. What are you going to do? It's, it's very unpleasant to think about. Again, we find comparisons between the bowls and the trumpets. Back in Revelation chapter 8, again, talking about the trumpets, which we already covered in this series, but just by way of reminder. The third trumpet blast, Revelation 8, starting in verse 10. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on the rivers and the springs of waters. And the star was named Wormwood, and a third of them became Wormwood, which means bitter. And many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. They were made impotable or unpotable. So again, the third bowl does in some ways what the third trumpet did, except it is now not just a third of the water that's undrinkable. It's now all of the water is undrinkable. The third trumpet, the waters were made bitter, but it never said what made them bitter. Did they turn to blood? It doesn't say that. But it's really a nominal point. They were undrinkable, a third of them. Now the remaining two-thirds, and all of it is turned to blood, and all of it is tainted. Think about this. Virtually no fresh water on the earth to drink or to water plants or crops, animals. If there were any supplies anywhere, maybe stored in a tank or maybe somewhere in a, in a reservoir or I don't know where, if there is any stockpile or supply of fresh water remaining, it would be extremely scarce. And you can imagine what people would do to get it. The value would be immeasurable. Life does not let last long without water. In fact, it's just a matter of days. Water is so critical to human life and to life in general that when we go exploring space, looking for life out there in the cosmos, what is the very first thing that we look for? Water. You've got to have water. And we're three bowls in, and all the salt water and all of the fresh water is now turned to blood. Fourth bowl. Starting in verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun. And it was given to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with fierce heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has the power of the plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. So here we see the fourth angel pouring his bowl out on the sun. The sun. And the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. Anybody here ever had a, a bad sunburn? I mean a bad one. It is not comfortable. It is extremely unpleasant. What we're talking about here will be worse than any sunburn we've ever had. Intense heat scorching the inhabitants of the earth. In those suffering from extreme sunburn, their response, still refusing to repent and give glory to God. Refusing to submit to Him. Now, when we look at the fourth bowl, it is somewhat similar to the first trumpet judgment. During the first trumpet judgment, back in Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, it says, When the first trumpet blast sounded, 
There came hell and fire mixed with blood, and they all came were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up. Burned up. A third of the trees were burned up. All the green and a third of the uh, green grass, all the green grass was burned up as well. So the first trumpet affected a fractional portion of the plants on the earth. Where is the fourth bowl? The extreme heat will be aimed at and, and impact the people on the earth, causing them to suffer with burns and being scorched from the sun. Modern environmentalists tell us that such a catastrophe could occur due to the deterioration of the ozone layer. The ozone layer, as you may know from your science classes, is a layer of our atmosphere that shields the earth from the sun's intense radiant heat. In other words, the earth is positioned right now in a place, the distance from the sun, to where it could burn if the ozone layer was not there to protect us. But in God's divine providence and glory, our Creator put a layer there that serves to shadow or to shield the earth from the earth, the sun's overly harmful and intense rays so that we get the right amount of heat from the sun and the right amount of radiant energy from the sun, but we don't get too much. But, the ozone layer has been shown in science to be deteriorating and even to have a hole above the South Pole as we speak. And as we all know, this and other factors that are involved in this same issue have led us to coin a, a phrase called global warming which is a popular and a oftentimes controversial topic. Is climate change, is global warming natural? Or is it man-made? Or is it, to some degree or another, both? Perhaps the most question, important question is this. Is there anything that we, as human beings, as a culture, as a, as a society can do to significantly or meaningfully change it? Nominal changes really don't make a difference. But is there anything that we can do to make significant changes in the climate change, the global warming, the ozone layer issue in this arena. Is there anything we can do? These are questions that oftentimes are the subject of much debate. And the uh, recipients of much money and energy and resources. And we all have various opinions on these issues regarding climate change. But let me just, let me just bottom line it for you. The Bible is very clear that in the last days the temperatures will rise, that the sun will scorch the inhabitants of the earth, that famine will be prevalent in part caused by extreme heat, drought will be persistent in part caused by extreme heat, people will suffer from the blistering rays of the sun. Will that happen because we caused it? Will that happen because of just natural processes? Beloved, however it happens, it's God's plan. It's God's judgment. The fourth bowl poured out on the sun. And so we come to the fifth bowl this morning, the final point today. 
Back in Revelation 16, now we find ourselves in verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. Next, John sees the fifth angel. And he pours out his bowl. Look where he pours it. Onto the throne of the beast. Who is the beast again? The Antichrist. And the kingdom of the Antichrist was, just use a single word here, darkened. Now we already know it's dark in terms of its evil, but the word darkened here means it's beginning to diminish. The sun, if you will, is beginning to set on the days of the Antichrist. Darkened. And he and his royal court false prophet and all of his croonies were plagued with painful sores. And it says these sores were so, so harmful that they gnawed their tongues in agony. And they blasphemed the name of God, still foolishly refusing to repent. Listen, when I was younger, after I had my uh, brain tumor and all of that during my high school years, one of the things that I had to do regularly for quite some time thereafter was have my blood drawn so that they could check my levels of, of dilantin to make sure that uh, I wasn't going to have another seizure. And I ended up having about five or six of them before it was all over with. But I often would get shots, and I would always get shots right here in this arm, right, right here. To the point that I still even have scarring here to, to this day a little bit. That's because my, my, my veins are terrible. I've got uncooperative veins. Apparently they lay really deep down in my arms. And they never can't get them. I've had numerous nurses sit there and just jab me again and again. Miss, miss, miss. I'm like, just stop. Just stop. Right over here, there's a mark. X marks the spot. Put it right there. That's the only vein that you can get that will rise up to the top and you can see it and you can hit it. I've had a lot of shots, but you know what? I still hate shots. I never got used to them, even to this day. And when I was a kid, 14 years old, 15 years old, and I was getting all those shots and it was just the beginning of, of that phase I went through in my life, one of the nurses, uh, one of the play, I believe, was in love, and told me, he said, she said, I got a trick for you. She said, if you will bite your tongue as we're giving you the shot, or just before we're giving you the shot, the brain and the nerves will trigger the, the pain in your tongue, and it will lessen the pain that you feel from the shot. And believe it or not, that it works. And so every time I get a shot right before, I, first of all, I look away, because I don't want to see it. But second, right as they're about to put it in there, I bite my tongue. Now, I don't make it bloody. But I mean, I bite it enough that there's, there's pain. And I, and I hold it. And I bite my tongue. And you know what? I rarely even feel the shot. Unless they hold it in my arm for two minutes and then I pass out. But I bite my tongue. Pain is so bad that the beast, the Antichrist, and his attendants, his royal court, will be gnawing on their tongues in agony. While the first bowl afflicted the worshipers of the beast, the fifth bowl, in many ways, is a continuation and an extension of the first bowl. The first bowl, sores fell upon those who worshipped the beast in his image. You remember that back in verse 2? Now we get to the fifth bowl and guess where the sores are going? To the beast, specifically, and to his attendants. 
The heavy persecution that the Antichrist has been wielding against the children of God throughout the Great Tribulation, which would be the past few years uh, during his reign and during his zenith of power, is now being turned against him. The Antichrist has directed all of his ire and all of his fury against the children of God and has continued to persecute and torment and martyr them. And now God says, okay, your turn. And now the judgment of God will fall directly on the Antichrist and his court. You know there's a saying out there that says what goes around comes around. The Bible gives us a principle that's a little bit more eloquent, but it means the same thing. You reap what you sow. This is just a universal, natural law of God. Now, you may not always reap it immediately, but in time, you, go, you will get what's coming to you. Listen, there's only one exception to that rule. There's only one, and you know what that is? Salvation through Jesus Christ. It's the only exception. As fallen sinners, we are the subject of God's judgment. We are by nature children of wrath, the Bible says. The only exception to not getting what we deserve, which is the judgment of God for our sin and our unholiness and our rebellion and our corruptness. The only exception is the blood of Jesus Christ and the grace that God offers through His Son. But if you refuse to repent, as they do right here, if you stubbornly resist God and you shake your fist in His face and you say no, and it may not come today or tomorrow. But judgment will come. And oh, when we get to the fifth bowl, now the tables have turned. And the Antichrist, who thought he was in charge, now suddenly finds himself the target of God's judgment. Pretty reminiscent of those demons dancing and celebrating. And then Sunday morning, that stone rolling back. And all of a sudden, oh no. We didn't win. We're not going to win. Well, I'm out of time. Let me wrap up. The bold judgments will take place of necessity <laughs> during the final months or even weeks or even days of the tribulation period. And they will set the stage for Christ's glorious return. Though the effects of the bold judgments will certainly impact the whole world. I mean, the whole world is affected when all the water turns to blood. That affects everybody. Certainly the whole world will be impacted. I want you to notice that the primary target of the bold judgments is the Antichrist and his followers. Let me just reemphasize that as we wrap up. The first bull was poured out exclusively on those who took the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. God's children not affected. You remember the judgments against Pharaoh? The Egyptians, devastated. The Hebrew children, not affected. We see that pattern again. The first bowl poured out on the worshippers of the beast. The third bowl, it says, it was primarily against those who martyred God's people. Remember what it said? They deserve it. Who is he talking about? The enemies of God who martyred the saints and the prophets. The primary focus is it's against them. The fourth bowl hit those who blasphemed God's name and refused to repent. Who's blaspheming God's name? Who's refusing to repent? Not his children. The enemies of God. 
the adversaries of God, the fifth bowl is pointed precisely at the Antichrist, his throne, his sinister kingdom. These bowls are targeted towards the enemies of God. Up to this point, the beast had imposed his tyrannical dictates and torments on the people of God throughout the Great Tribulation period. He and his wicked cohorts had imposed severe persecutions and tortures and oppressions and, excuse me, martyrdom against Israel, against the tribulation saints, against any who would refuse to bow the knee to them throughout all of the Great Tribulation period. But here as we reach the end, his power is beginning to slip. God's judgment is beginning to fall upon him. The tables are turning. The writing is now on the wall. The Antichrist can see that his time is short. And he is becoming increasingly crazed and increasingly desperate because the end is near. You know what they say about a wounded animal, right? A wounded animal is more dangerous than a non-wounded animal. Because they lash out. They're in incredible pain. They're desperate. Well, the beast, beloved, at this point, is a wounded animal. And the question becomes, what will he do? What will he do to try to cling to his power to try to hold on to his kingdom to try to put an end to God's judgment upon him and his worshipers what will he do come back next Sunday and we'll look as we get into the 6th and the 7th bowl which deal with this issue Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to open your word and to study it. Again, just like I've said multiple times in this series, these messages are, are hard to listen to. But God, we know that you are a just God. And we know that a just God will not allow injustice to persist forever. Though you are patient, though you are loving, though you are long-suffering, and though it is your desire that all would come to salvation and all would come to a knowledge of who you are and all would be covered by the blood of Christ through faith in Him as our Lord and Savior, we know that's not going to happen. Your Word says, Broad is the road. And broad is the gate that leads to destruction, but only narrow is the road that leads to salvation and eternal life. Sadly, the overwhelming majority will reject you, and they will be subject to the wrath of God. And they deserve it because they have rejected the Son. Lord God, I pray that we would be careful to share your message of love and hope to others so that they can receive you and respond to you while there is still time. Because one day there will be golden bowls of God's wrath poured out upon the earth. And I pray, Lord, that by that point all of our friends and family and even our enemies would have chosen you as their Lord and Savior. Father, forgive us where we fail you, and if anyone has a decision to make during this invitation, allow them to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.